Opening Volume 8 of Tabati's History, The Victory of Islam, we are confronted by an editor's note. Rather somber in tone, it reveals that years 5 through 8 of the Islamic era were ugly. We discover, in quotes, the religion embodied in the Quran changed dramatically. Mecca capitulated. Medina became a purely Muslim polity. The last remaining Jewish tribe was annihilated. Internal Arab opposition from the hypocrites disintegrated. In short, although Muhammad had begun the period as a local phenomenon, by the end he was king of Arabia. End of quote. But some things remain the same. If six wives were good, seven were even better. Tabari, in this year, the messenger married Zainab bit Jahash, a first cousin. But it wasn't as simple as all of that. The story that follows may be more shocking than pedophilia. And that's because Allah wallows in it. It begins with our hero stumbling into the home of his adopted son, Zayed. Allah's messenger came to the house of Zayed bin, or son of, Muhammad. Perhaps the messenger missed him at the moment. Zainab, Zayed's wife, rose to meet him. Because she was dressed only in a shift, the holy prophet turned away from her. She said, He is not here. Come in. You are as dear to me as my father and mother. Muhammad refused to enter. Zainab had dressed in haste when she heard that the prophet was at her door. She jumped up eagerly and excited the admiration of Allah's messenger, so that he turned away, murmuring something that could scarcely be understood. However, he did say overtly, Glory be to Allah Almighty, who causes hearts to turn. That, of course, would make Allah the god of lust, better known as Satan. Since the Islamic era dawned with pedophilia, it should be no surprise that our lustful libertine has migrated to the verge of incest. The same man who asked his son Ali to serve as bait for Arab swordsmen in Mecca and for a Jewish rock roller in Medina now sends his other son, Zayed, off on a terrorist raid so he might excitedly admire his daughter-in-law. Glory be. Tabari. When Zayed came home, Zainab told him that Muhammad had come. Zayed said, Why didn't you ask him to come in? Zainab replied, I asked him, but he refused. Did he say anything? Glory be to Allah Almighty, who causes hearts to turn. So Zayed went to Muhammad. Prophet, I have heard that you came to my house. Why didn't you go in? Dad. Perhaps Zainab has excited your admiration, so I will leave her. Zayed left her, and she became free. While the messenger of Allah was talking with Asia, a fainting overcame him. When he was released from it, he smiled and said, Who will go to Zainab and tell her the good news? Allah has married her to me. Gods like that can only be found buried in Arabian rock piles. Then the holy prophet recited, Quran 33, to the end of the passage, Aisha said, I became very uneasy because of what we heard about her beauty, and another thing, the loftiest of matters, what Allah had done for her personally by giving her to him in marriage. I said that she would boast of it over us. The victim of prophetic pedophilia had become so insecure, she was jealous of the object of inspired incest. This isn't a very attractive picture. Before we peek into the 33rd surah to see why the God of Islam authorized his lone prophet to indulge in this kind of immorality, let's examine the second hadith. Incest is a serious offense. If Allah's lone conduit was guilty of such a crime, he became worthy of condemnation, not admiration. Tabari, one day Muhammad went out looking for Zayed. Now there was a covering of hair cloth over the doorway, but the wind had lifted the covering so that the doorway was uncovered. Zainab was in her chamber undressed, and admiration for her entered the heart of the prophet. After that, Allah made her unattractive to Zayad. Now that we have exposed Zainab and confirmed that the motive was lust, it's time to expose Allah and the nature of Muhammad's situational scriptures. While the 33rd surah called the Confederates isn't the Quran's most lethal, it is its most vulgar. Quran 33 verse 1, 
Prophet Muhammad, fear Allah and do not obey the disbelievers and hypocrites. Lo, Allah is nowhere wise. A second translation says, Prophet, be careful of Allah and do not comply with the unbelievers and hypocrites. Allah is condemning the hypocrites, the same people Muhammad has been assailing for being peaceful and disobedient Muslims. But in the context of this story on incest, it's lunacy for him to do so. Our boy was committing pedophilia while lusting for incest, and Allah had the nerve to call his critics hypocrites. The greatest hypocrite who ever lived prevailed by projecting his own faults on those with the good sense to question his scandalous lifestyle. Quran 33 verse 2 Follow that which comes to you by inspiration from your Lord, for Allah is well acquainted with all that you do. It is obvious who his Lord must have been. The last hadith said that while engaged in pedophilia with Asia, the Prophet was inspired to commit incest with Zainab. If you were wavering as to whether the Quran was divine revelation or simply situational scriptures, you have just been given a rather poignant clue. Imagine the preposterousness of God jotting down and then endorsing a specific incident of prophetic immorality before creating the universe and then handing such rubbish down to a pirate as his final revelation to mankind. Yet that is precisely what must have happened if Islam is to be believed. Quran 33 verse 3 and put your trust in Allah. Enough is Allah as a disposer of affairs. Allah has not made for any man two hearts in his body, nor has he made your wives, whom you divorce your mothers, nor has he made your adopted sons your sons. Such is only your manner of speech by your mouths. But Allah tells the truth, and he shows the right way. Endorsing incest is sticky business. So that we aren't too rash in our condemnation, let's give the Islamic God another chance. Allah hath not assigned unto any man two hearts within his body, nor hath he made your wives whom ye declared your mothers, nor hath he made those whom ye claim to be your sons your sons. This is but a saying of your mouths, but Allah saith the truth, and he showeth the way. That translation wasn't any better. A third and fourth translation served to confirm my original theory of child abuse stemming from Muhammad's mother having abandoned him. If this occurred, it would explain why he craved women, why he mistreated them, and why he saw them fulfilling maternal roles. Allah has not made for any man two hearts within him, nor has he made your wives who you liken to your mother, nor has he made those whom you assert to be sons your real sons. And... Your wives, whom you declare to be like your mother, your real mother. Next, the dark spirit of Islam demeans adoption to satiate Muhammad's cravings. Quran 33, 5. Call them by the names of their fathers, that is, juster in the sight of Allah. But if ye know not their fathers' names, call them your brothers' names in faith, or your slaves. But if there is no blame on you, or if ye make mistake therein, what counts is the intention of your hearts, and Allah is oft returning, most merciful. This pretense of scripture continues to wallow in the muck of Muhammad's troubled mind. But before we go to the next verse, I would like you to hear what Allah actually revealed without the help of his translator's additions. Call them by of their fathers, that is, juster in the sight of Allah. But if ye know not their fathers, your brothers in faith, or your slaves, but there is no blame on you if ye make a mistake therein, the intention of your hearts, and Allah is oft returning most merciful. That takes us to the sixth verse. The prophet has a greater claim on the faithful than they have on themselves. And his wives are their mothers, and the possessors of relationship have the better claim in the ordinance of Allah to inheritance, one with respect to another, than other believers, and than those who have fled. Nevertheless, do what is just to your closest friends. This is written in the book. Let me take a whack at interpreting this for you. A 57-year-old man in bed with a 12-year-old girl 
just told us that his god, a pagan rock idol, inspired him to say that he has first dibs on anyone and anything he covets. Then he says that his claim to inheriting the Kaaba ink is superior to all others. But to assure that the Meccan Muslims would continue supporting him, he says that they are next in line. What makes this so damning is that the justification is alleged to be scriptural. It's the heavenly endorsement of the profitable profit plan, the means to steal power, sex, and money.